Hello and welcome to the introduction for this course. What you should know before you take the course, you should have a basic working knowledge of using a computer. You should also have a basic working knowledge of using the internet. Who should take this course? The course is designed for beginners to Python and Jupyter Notebook. Also designed for beginners to coding and programming in general. What will you learn on the course? We'll start off by installing Jupyter Notebook. We'll then learn how to run the Jupyter Notebook server. We'll learn about some common Jupyter commands. We'll learn about the components that make up the Jupyter Notebook. We'll learn about exploring the Notebook dashboard. We'll explore the user interface within the Jupyter Notebook. We'll create notebooks. We'll look at Python expressions, Python statements. We'll take a look at variables and how to create variables in Python. We'll take a look at data types in Python. We will learn how to cast data types. That is how to change from one data type to another. We'll learn about Python operators. We'll learn about conditional statements. We'll learn about loops. We'll also learn about Python functions. The format of the course is video based and the duration is 2.5 hours long. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. What is Jupyter Notebook? The Jupyter Notebook is an interactive computing environment that enables users to experiment with code and it also allows users to share the code. The Jupyter is a loose acronym, which means Julia, Python, and R. These programming languages were the first target languages of the Jupyter application. But nowadays, the notebook technology also supports many other languages. The notebook is a document that can consist of live code, rich text, interactive widgets, equations, video, images, and so on. These documents basically provide a complete and self-contained record of a computation that can be converted to various formats and then shared with others. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be showing you how to install Anaconda and also how to set up the Jupyter Notebook. To begin, open up your Google search bar and inside the search bar, just type in Anaconda distribution and press enter and just select the first on the list. So I'm going to click on this one here that says Anaconda Python slash R distribution. Click on that and that will detect the operating system you have. If you're running a Mac, it will detect you have a Mac. So I'm just going to scroll down to the bottom here and right at the bottom, it will detect my operating system. So it has detected that I'm running a Windows based operating system and it presents me with the Windows installer. As of the time I am recording this video, the current version is 3.7. When you do visit to do your own download, the version may change. Just download the most recent version that you see. So to download, I have under the windows there are two links one for a 64-bit and one for a 32-bit i've got a 64-bit so i'm going to click on the 64-bit graphical installer so you can see here is downloading on the bottom left hand corner of my screen i'll wait for that download to complete and then i'll run the installer the anaconda installer has completed downloading so that's it here so to run it i just 
double click to begin the installation. So it's trying to launch. Just click on next and then click to agree. And there are two ways you can install it. You can install it just for your user profile, which is the recommended one, or you can use or install it for all users. If you're going to use the all users, you need to have admin privileges. I just want to install it on one profile. So I'm going to click on the top option, which is going to install it just for me. So I'll click next and then it tells you the destination folder where it's going to install it. it tells you the space required 2.9 gigabyte and it tells me the space I have got available. So make sure you do have enough disk space in your designated installation directory. So I'm going to click next and I'm going to accept this option here that has been checked and I'm going to leave this one that has been unchecked. It says not recommended. So I'll click install to install. So we just wait for the installation to complete. So I'm just going to give it a few minutes to run through the installation. Once the installation is completed, you will get this that says completed and just click on the next button and click next. And then if you want to learn more about Anaconda in the cloud, you can leave that checked. I'm going to uncheck that. If you want to learn more on Anaconda, you can leave that checked. I'm going to leave this unchecked and click finish. Another way you can set up the Jupyter Notebook is by using the Python package manager, which is known as pip. This is recommended only for the experienced Python users. So before you set up the Jupyter notebook using pip, you must make sure you already have Python installed. And then you need to make sure you have the most recent and updated version of the Python package manager, which is known as pip. And the way you can do that, if you are using a Mac, if you've got a MacBook, Mac comes pre-installed with Python version 2.7. So if you want to upgrade pip on a Mac, you will, you will have to type in pip3, which means that you are referring to pip version 3 and not version 2.7. So you do pip3 on a Mac, space install, dash dash upgrade pip and that will upgrade pip if you're on a windows based computer you don't need to type in pip3 just type in pip install dash dash upgrade pip and that will upgrade to the most recent version of pip and then if you want to install the jupyter notebook using the python package manager you type in pip3 if you're on a mac install and then Jupyter. If you're running a Windows based computer, you type in pip space install Jupyter. So if you are doing this on a Mac, you obviously have to do that on your terminal. If you're doing the installation on a Windows based computer, you have to do this on the command prompt. For new users, it is highly recommended that you install the Jupyter notebook via the Anaconda way because if you install Anaconda, Anaconda will also install Python and the Jupyter Notebook. So let's take a look at what Anaconda has installed. We go to our programs menu and look for the Anaconda folder. So this is my Anaconda 3 folder. If I expand that, I can see what it has installed. It installed the Anaconda Navigator, Anaconda PowerShell Prompt, Anaconda prompt the Jupyter notebook, which is what we are really interested in here. And then we've got this reset spider settings. So we can see here by installing Anaconda, it also installs the Jupyter notebook. So that is it for this video. In this video, we installed Anaconda and Anaconda also installed the Jupyter Notebook for us. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be showing you ways to start 
the Jupyter Notebook. You can start the Jupyter Notebook server from the command line. If you are using a Windows based computer, that will be the command prompt. If you're using a Mac or a Linux based computer, that will be the terminal. So once you've got your command line opened, you type in this command Jupyter space notebook and that will start the Jupyter server. The other way to start the Jupyter notebook server is from the all programs menu in your Windows based computer. If you go to the Anaconda folder within the all programs, there should be an icon there for Jupyter notebook. You can run it from there as well. Once the Jupyter Notebook server is started, it opens up the Jupyter Notebook in your default web browser. And it does that on localhost and the port it uses is 8888. Let's launch the Jupyter Notebook from the All Programs menu on our Windows based computer. So if you click on all programs, go to start all programs and there should be the Anaconda 3 folder. So if you just expand it and inside there you see the Jupyter notebook. So just click on this and that will start. It will launch a console screen like this and then it will also launch the Jupyter notebook in your web browser. So this is what the Jupyter Notebook dashboard looks like once you have launched the Jupyter Notebook and inside this dashboard area here it gives you a list that shows a list of notebooks, files and subdirectories in the directory where the notebook server was started. So if you launch in the Jupyter Notebook from the All Programs menu, it will start from the root directory where the Jupyter Notebook was installed. And it also lists some directories and subdirectories from that root directory. So your directory listing will be different from mine depending on what you've got in your specific directory where the Jupyter Notebook has started inside the root of your directory. Most of the time you can start a notebook server in the highest level directory that contains notebooks. All right, well, this basically is going to be the root directory and can also be the home directory if you are on a Mac or a Linux based computer. You can also specify the directory that you want the notebook to start from. And you do that by using, by starting the Jupyter Notebook server from the command prompt. While the Jupyter Notebook is running inside the console area here. So if you look at, look at the terminal interface here, the command line gives you a lot of information here. It tells you where the notebook is starting from. So it's serving the notebook from the local directory, which is on my C drive under the users directory and then under the profile administrator. All right. And then it tells you where the Jupyter notebook is running at in the web browser, which is localhost colon double eight double eight to shut down or exit the Jupyter notebook server. You just do control dash C on your keyboard and that should shut down the Jupyter Notebook server. Once you shut down the Jupyter Notebook server, you will not be able to access the Jupyter Notebook on the web browser. You can see here because I've shut the server down, you can see here it's not able to contact the server. I have shown you how to start the Jupyter Notebook server from the programs menu on a Windows based computer, which opened up the console and also opened up the notebook in your web browser on localhost 
colon 8888. I'm not going to show you how to start the Jupyter Notebook from the command line, which is the command prompt on a Windows based computer, but the process is the same on the terminal. Notice that when you start the Jupyter Notebook from the Anaconda folder within the All Programs menu, it will start that from the root directory of your profile where the Jupyter Notebook was installed. When you're starting it from the command line, you can specify where you want it to start from. I've got a project directory here. It's an empty directory. I'm going to make the Jupyter Notebook start from this project directory. So to do that, I go to all programs and inside the Anaconda folder, we've got the Anaconda prompt. So this is what I'm going to use. So I click on the Anaconda prompt and I'll wait for it to launch. So you can see, tells me the base, which is, so this is the default where the Jupyter notebook will start. Okay. Unless you change it. I want to change that to my desktop. So I do CD desktop. I press enter and I do CD. There's a folder called projects on my desktop. So I'll just do CLS to clear the screen. So now I have navigated to this folder here called project. That's where I want to start the Jupyter notebook. So I just type in Jupyter space notebook and press enter and it will start the Jupyter notebook. You can see it's trying to start it. You can see here because there's nothing in that root directory. That's why you can't see any subdirectories here because the actual directory is empty. All right. And you can see here, it tells me where the Jupyter notebook is being served from. It tells you the path, the directory path. Always a good idea to pay attention to what's going on in the console in case there's anything that you are not sure with or if it doesn't work the way you expect it. All right. So running the Jupyter Notebook from a specified directory is also useful for project based stuff so that if there are certain things you want to keep in a specific directory, then you can serve the Jupyter Notebook server from that directory. In this video, I showed you a couple of ways of starting the Jupyter Notebook. One from the command line where you could specify a directory for the Jupyter Notebook to be served from. And I also showed you how to start it from the Anaconda folder within the All Programs menu of your Windows-based computer. When you start it from the Anaconda folder, there is a Jupyter Notebook icon that you can run. And by default, it serves the Jupyter Notebook from the root directory of your profile. And when the Jupyter Notebook opens up, it opens up in your default web browser on localhost colon 8888. The port number is 8888. So that's it for this video on running the Jupyter Notebook server. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to show you some common and useful Jupyter commands. All Jupyter commands are prefixed with the keyword Jupyter before the sub commands are issued. The Jupyter keyword basically is the primary namespace for all sub commands. Let's take a look at a table showing some common Jupyter commands. So this is a table here and we have some useful and commonly used Jupyter command. First one here in the table is the command to start the Jupyter notebook. You just type in Jupyter space notebook and that will start the Jupyter notebook application. If you want to see all the available commands that Jupyter has and you want some information as well, you just type in Jupyter space dash dash help and that will show you the available commands that Jupyter has. If you want to see the location of the configuration directory, you type in Jupyter space dash dash config dash 
DIR. If you want to see the location of the data directory, you type in Jupyter space dash dash data dash DIR. If you want to see the location of the runtime directory, you type in Jupyter space dash dash runtime dash DIR. If you want to show all the Jupyter directories and the search path, you type in Jupyter space dash dash path. If you want to print out the directories and search path in a JSON format, you type in Jupyter space dash dash JSON. So let's open up the command prompt in Anaconda and show you how these commands work. I'm going to illustrate how these commands work. So in my Windows computer, I'm going to go to all programs and I'm going to look for the Anaconda 3 folder, which is this folder here. I'm going to expand that and I'm going to select the Anaconda prompt. I'll click on that and that should open up this console, this terminal. If you're doing this on a Mac or a Linux based computer, you can just do this on your terminal. So you can see here it says base. That is the base directory. That's where the Jupyter Notebook application will start from. So if I want to start the Jupyter Notebook application and I do not want the web interface to show, this is the command I will type. I'll type in Jupyter space notebook and then you do a space dash dash no dash browser. What that means, it will start the Jupyter Notebook, but it will not show me the browser interface. So I press enter and that should start the Jupyter Notebook in this base directory. But even though it gives me the location of the web browser interface, it will not launch it because I've said I don't want the browser to display. To shut down the server, you just type in control dash C and that will stop the server. So let's stop the server now that we have issued this command. So I just do control C and that will stop the server. Okay. So you can see I've done a control C. It has shut down the server. All right. So I'm just going to clear my screen by typing in CLS so that I can type in more commands. The next command I want to type in is the help command. So if I want to see the available commands and want some information, I just type in Jupyter space dash dash help. If you don't want to type in help, you can type in dash H that will also do the same thing and press enter. And you can see here, it gives you some information about the Jupyter Notebooks, it tells you usage here, um, Jupyter Interactive Computing and gives you some optional arguments. So very useful information. And to clear the screen again, type in CLS so that I can type in more command. The next command I'm going to type in is to show the location of the configuration directory. So I just type in Jupyter space and it would be dash dash config config dash dir I press enter and that shows me my configuration directory the next command I want to show the location of the data directory so I'll type in Jupyter space dash dash data dash dir and press enter you see that shows me the location of my data directory. If I want to show the location of the runtime directory, I'll type in Jupyter space dash dash runtime dash dir. Press enter and that gives me 
the location of the runtime directory. If I want to show all the Jupyter directories and their search path, I type in Jupyter space and I type in dash dash path with an S and press enter and that will show me all the path. Okay, it shows me the location of all the Jupyter directories and their search path. So you can see it's listed quite a few. The final command I am going to type in is going to be a command that will print the directories and search path in machine readable JSON format. So to do that, type in Jupyter again, space, dash, dash, JSON and press enter. You can see here it's giving me the path. So in this video, I've shown you some commonly used Jupyter commands. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we will take a look at the components of the Jupyter Notebook. The Jupyter Notebook application is a client server application. A client server application basically is a distributed application structure that partitions tasks or workloads between the providers of a resource or a service, which are usually called servers, and the service requesters, which are usually called clients. So the server, which is represented by this box here, is the resource provider. And then we have the client in terms of Jupyter Notebook, that could be your web browser because the Jupyter Notebook also has a web component, which is a web browser, which will act as the client to the server. So the client will be requesting services from the server which is the provider of the resource. In a client server application, it can also provide resources to other clients and clients can include other computers. It could be remote and you can access the server which can be remote over the internet using different types of client like your mobile phone, your laptop, or your computer device. The main components of the Jupyter Notebook include the Notebook web application. We also have the kernel, and then we have the Notebook documents. So let me give you a brief description of each of the components of the Jupyter Notebook. The first is the Notebook web application. This is basically an interactive web application that you can use to write and run your code interactively. You can also use it to author notebook documents. The second Jupyter Notebook component is called the kernels. The kernels basically are separate processes started by the notebook web application and it usually runs in the user's code and it runs in a given language. The default language is Python, but it can run in other languages. And what it does, it returns the output from the notebook web application back to the notebook web application. And the kernel basically handles things like compute computations for interactive widgets, tab completion, introspection, and other bits and pieces. So the kernel basically interacts with the notebook web application. The third component is called the notebook document. The notebook document is basically a self-contained document that contains a representation of all the content that is visible inside the notebook web application. This includes the inputs you have and also the outputs which are produced from the kernel. Okay, 
It also includes narrative text, equations, images. It can also include videos, rich media representation of objects. And each of the notebook documents has its own kernel. So there is a kernel for Python. There's a kernel for other programming languages as well. So that's it for this video. In this video, I just gave you a brief introduction to the various components of the Jupyter Notebook. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to take a quick look at the Notebook dashboard. To begin, we have to start the Notebook server. So I'm going to be doing this on a Windows 10 machine. So in the All Programs menu, I've got to look for the Anaconda 3 folder, which is this folder here. And in there, there is an icon here for Jupyter Notebook. If I click to run this icon, it will start up the Jupyter Notebook server from the root directory where it was installed. If I don't want to start it from the directory where it was installed, I can use this Anaconda prompt command and then specify a directory where it should be started from. But for this video, I'm going to start it from the default, which is where it was installed. So I click on the icon for Jupyter Notebook and it will launch this Jupyter Notebook interface. You see it launches the web browser and it also launches this here. So from here, you can see where the Jupyter Notebook is running at. It tells you serving the notebook from this local directory, which is C users administrator, and it will list everything in that directory inside the dashboard. So let's take a look at the dashboard. So this is what the Jupyter dashboard looks like. When you first start up the notebook server, your web browser will open to this notebook dashboard. The dashboard basically will serve as a home page for the notebook. Its main purpose is to display the notebooks and the files in the current directory. For example, the current directory it is showing here is this directory, c slash user slash administrator, and it will list what is got in that directory, which is, is listed here. Yours will be different from mine because what you've got in your directory will obviously be different from my directory. Okay. And then we've got the breadcrumbs at the top here, the top of the notebook list here. It will display clickable breadcrumbs. These are all clickable breadcrumbs of the current directory. By clicking on these breadcrumbs, or these subdirectories in the notebook list, you can navigate your file system. So if you want to see any of these here, just there, you can see they are all clickable links to their respective directories. Okay. If you want to see what's running in the dashboard, you click on running and it shows you whatever is running at the moment. You can see there's no terminal running. There's no notebook running. Also, if you want to upload, you can click here to upload files and so on. It tells you here when the these subdirectories were last modified. This little name arrow here basically is used to sort the list, the directory subdirectories in this list here. You can see the arrow is pointing down, which means it is sorting them in alphabetical order. If you want to sort it the other way, say from Z to A, you can see the arrow has gone up and it's flipped it and sorted it from Z to A. So I'm going to put it back. And then you can see here, this is just referring to the file size. If you want to quit the dashboard, you can click on quit or you can click on log out. I'm going to click log out and that has successfully logged me out of the dashboard. Okay. And then if I want to quit the server, I just type in this command here, control C, and that will quit the Jupyter server. So that is it for this video. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. 
In this video, we are going to take a look at the notebook user interface. When you create a new notebook or when you open an existing notebook, you will be presented with the notebook user interface. This user interface allows you to run your code, author your notebook documents interactively. The notebook user interface has three main areas. We have the menu, we have the toolbar, we have the notebook area and the cells. I have got my dashboard open and I have got one notebook inside my dashboard. At the moment, the notebook is not running. So to run it, I'm just gonna double click on it and that will run the notebook. So you can see here the notebook is running. It has now presented me with the user interface. So I'll start with the menu bar. This area here is known as the menu bar. And the menu bar has menus for actions on the notebooks, the notebook cells, and the kernel it communicates with. The file here basically is, you can use this file option inside the menu. You can use that to change the file name for the notebook. And then you've got the edit, if you want to edit, you've got the view, you've got insert, it allows you to insert cells above or cells below. This here is called a cell, okay? This border area here is called a cell where the code is. And then you have the kernel, which is running at the moment. We've got widgets. So you can save the notebook, the state of the widget. You can clear the notebook widget. You can download the widget and so on. And then you've got the help menu. Okay. So that this bar, this area here is known as the menu bar. And then we've got here, this line here is called the notebook toolbar area okay the toolbar has several buttons for the most common actions so if you want to see what each of the buttons do just hover your mouse over each button for more information for example if i hover over it tells you that is a save and checkpoint and that tells you that's inserting a cell this is cut selected cell copy selected cell, paste, and this says move selected cells up, move selected cell down. This enables you to run the cell. This interrupts the kernel. This one restarts the kernel with a dialog. And this basically restarts the kernel. The notebook has mode indicators. Mode indicators basically indicate which mode the cells are, if they're in edit mode or if they are in command mode. You can tell they're in command mode if it's got a blue strip around the cell. So if you click here, if I click on this now, if it's got a green strip around the cell, it's in edit mode. So you can see here, this icon here tells you it is edit mode. If I click outside the edit mode, you can see now this is showing as the command mode. So it's very important to know that there are two mode indicator, which you can identify by the colors around the cell. So if you've got a blue color around the cell, that's a command mode, which means you can issue command. If you've got a green strip around it, you are in the edit mode, which means you can edit the previous code you've got in the cell. Also here inside the toolbar area, we've got this icon here, which is a command palette. So if I click on that, it gives you the command group. So if you want to use shortcuts for setting things, you can do that from here. All the navigation and actions in the notebook interface are available using the mouse through the menu bar and the toolbar. 
which are both inside the notebook area. So that's the menu bar and this is the toolbar. So you can use the mouse to navigate through the various actions you want to perform. To select a cell with your mouse, you just click on the cell and that selects it. And if you want to change the mode, for example, the mode at the moment is edit mode. You just click outside the cell and it changes the mode to the command mode. So that is it for this video. In this video, we took a look at the notebook user interface. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to be creating a new notebook. Before we create the new notebook, I just want to point out a few things. A notebook will have the file extension .ipynb. Also, a notebook consists of three basic type of cells. They are code cells, which will include the input and output of the live code that runs in the kernel. And then we have the markdown cells, which are narrative text that contains embedded latex equations. We also have the raw cells, which include unformatted text. Also, notebooks can be exported to different static formats, which include HTML and PDF. Before we can create a notebook, we have to start the server. So the Jupyter Notebook server, I'm going to start it from a specified directory. I've got a directory on my desktop called My Notebooks. It's an empty directory at the moment, but this is where I want the Jupyter Notebook server to start from. And any notebook I create will be inserted inside this directory. So to begin, I go to my terminal, I look for my Anaconda folder, and then I'll click on this that says Anaconda prompt. This will give me the prompt, which will give me the default location for Anaconda. And I'm going to change that to start from my desktop. And on my desktop, I'm going to change directory to a folder called my notebooks all right and i'll just clear the screen so now i'm in the directory to start the jupyter notebook server i just type in jupyter space notebook and that will start the jupyter notebook server in that directory i have specified all right so it's trying to launch the jupyter notebook so this is the dashboard and you can see the dashboard here this is the root directory of the this directory on my desktop here that's what the jupyter notebook dashboard is pointing to it's empty at the moment because the there is no notebook list there's nothing in that directory so to create a new notebook there is a new option that says new you click on this new button at the top here and all these are called kernels so whatever kernels you see here depends on what's installed on the server all right so these are my available kernels and i'm going to click python 3 because i want to create it in python 3 so it's going to open up a new cell this is what is called a cell and if you see here the default cell is a code all right, and if I click on the drop down, you can see there are other types. There's a markdown and there's a raw NB convert, but we're going to leave the default, which is code. So I'm going to click on it, and this is where you can write a live code. So I'm just going to type in print and just say hello world. So I've just typed in a simple print statement that's going to say hello world and to run this cell you can click on the run button here or you can do 
you can do shift and enter. Okay, so I'm going to click run and that will run the cell. You can see here it has given me the output of that cell. So we notice here the notebook is untitled at the moment. So I need to give it a name. To, to do that, you double click on it and I'm going to call it Hello World. And then I'll click on this rename button and you can see the name of the notebook has changed. If you want to see the notebooks that are currently running, you can click on your home screen here and you can see this is running. You can tell that it's running because it's got this green icon next to it. I've only got the one notebook at the moment, but it's possible to have multiple notebooks running at the same time. Also, while the notebook is running, there is a box here you can check. If you check on it, it gives you some options. You can duplicate the notebook, you can shut it down, you can view, you can edit, and you can also delete. So I'm just going to uncheck that box, but you see those options when you have the box checked. If you have it unchecked, the options disappear. If I take a look at my project directory on my desktop, you can see here that it has saved the notebook. This is the notebook here with the extension IPYNB. It has saved it into my projects directory. If you have other notebook files, you can also upload them using this upload button, or you can just drag them into the notebook area here in the dashboard. The notebook shows the green icon when the notebook is currently running and notebooks remain running until you explicitly shut them down. Closing the notebooks page is not sufficient to shut the notebook down. So if you want to shut it down, you click on this check there and then there is an option to shut the notebook down. Notice I've shut it down and the icon now is no longer green. So that is it for this video. In this video, we created a new notebook. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video on what is Python. Python is a general purpose programming language. This means it can be used to write computer programs for various things like games, data science, websites, and so on. Python is also a high level programming language. High level programming languages mean that the languages of writing computer instructions in a way that is easily understandable and close to human language. Python is portable, which means we can run Python programs in the various different operating systems like Windows, Mac OS, Linux, without any changes. Python is an interpreted language. Python is called an interpreted language because it goes through an interpreter, which turns code you write into the language understood by your computer's processor. Python is strongly typed. Strongly typed languages don't convert data from one type to another type automatically. Python has a huge set of libraries. A Python library is a collection of programs you can incorporate into your own program without writing code for them. Let's take a look at a list of application types you can create with Python. Web applications. These are applications you can access using a web browser. Android applications. 
These are applications that runs on Android devices like Android phones and tablets, games. You can create various types of games with Python, scientific applications. You can create various types of scientific applications with Python, system administration applications. So you can use Python to create applications to monitor various types of systems. You can also create console applications. A console application basically is a computer program designed to be used via a text only computer interface. Let's take a look at a list of software applications that have been created using Python. So some of these are quite famous and popular. First on the list is YouTube. And then we have Google. We have Dropbox. This program lets you save files to a cloud based service that you can then access from anywhere in the world. We've also got Reddit. Reddit is one of the biggest open communities on the web. You have a question you want to talk about something in specific, or if you want to find tons of information regarding a particular topic, uh, for example, gardening or anything, you can just look on Reddit and find related information. Next, we have Spotify. Spotify allows you to listen to ad free music of your choice. This is a streaming service that allows you to stream music without any advertisement. Finally, we've got Instagram. Instagram is very popular. It has both an app site and also a web site as well. And these are just a few list items of software that were created using Python. There are so many others, but these are just some few that you may have come across. So that is it for this video on what is Python. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, I will introduce you to high and low level programming languages. What are high level programming languages? These are languages that only humans can understand. So computers can't understand them unless they are compiled or interpreted. They need an interpreter or a compiler for the computer or the machine to understand what the programming is trying to get it to do. Examples of high level programming languages include Python, Java, C sharp, C++, PHP, Ruby, and there are many others. What are low level programming languages? These are languages that only machines can understand. They do not need an interpreter or a compiler. They are closer to the computer hardware. Examples include machine and assembly language. This is a brief illustration of high and low level languages. So you can see the nearer the language is to the hardware of the machine, the faster it is and it doesn't need to be interpreted because it's so close to the computer hardware. Whereas the further away it is, like we've got these lot here, they are further away from the hardware. So they need, they're easier for programmers to understand because they contain English related words, but not machine to understand. So for the machine to understand what this block here is saying, it needs to be converted into machine code using a compiler or an interpreter.
key differences between high level and low level programming languages. High level languages are easier to learn. Low level languages are more difficult to learn. High level languages are near to human languages. That's easy to read. They are like basic English. While low level languages are far from human languages. So only machines know what they are talking about. You need a translator, like a compiler or an interpreter, to convert a high level language into machine language. You, no translator is needed for low level languages because the machine hardware knows what they're talking about. Programs written in high level languages are slow in execution because obviously they have to compile or interpret them. While programs developed in low level languages are much faster in execution because there's no compiling or interpretation going on. The hardware understands the language, so it's easy or easier to execute the instructions. So these are the key differences between high level and low level programming languages. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to compilers and interpreters. What is a compiler? A compiler is used to translate the entire source code into machine language before the code is executed. So basically what that means is that the computer, for the computer to understand um, what it is you're trying to get it to do, you have to use a compiler to compile or translate, convert your code into a code that the machine can read. All right. Examples of languages that are compiled. That means languages you have to compile before the code is executed includes C and C++. So let me illustrate how the compiler works. So let's say you have your source code and your source code is basically your computer code that you write. So let's say inside the source file, you have this, you've got X equals seven, Y equals eight, and then the sum is equals to X plus Y. And then you want to print the value of the sum using the print function. Now the computer will not understand this. So what needs to happen, you need to use the compiler to convert that code into machine code. The machine code is something like this called computers only understand zeros and one. So the compiler compiles it into a machine code and then it executes the code. It then passes it on to the computer memory and the computer memory then outputs the result in this case, which is 15. So that's basically how a compiler works. Compiler will compile the entire code into a machine code before it passes the information to the CPU to display the result. What is an interpreter? An interpreter does a similar job like a compiler. The key difference with the interpreter is that the interpreter will translate or convert one line of code at a time, okay, into machine language before the code is executed. Examples of interpreted languages include Python and Perl. So let me show you an illustration of how an interpreter would work. So let's say you have your source file and you have this bunch of code inside your source file. At this stage, the computer would not understand that. So for the computer to be able to interpret what you're saying, you need to use an interpreter. So the way the interpreter works is that it will convert a line at a time. So for example, it would do 
x equals to 7, compile that and run it, you'll do a y equals to 8, it will translate or convert that and then run it, it does line by line. In comparison to a compiler that compiles the old code into a machine code before it executes. In case of an interpreter, it does it line by line and then eventually it will produce the result. This is a brief table that illustrates some key differences between compilers and interpreters. Uh, compilers basically will transform the entire source code while interpreter will transform line by line of the source code. The compilers will generate a machine code first before it executes. The interpreter does not generate any machine code. The Because the compiler generates intermediate machine code, it uses more memory. The interpreter uses less memory. Compiled languages run once. So once you've compiled it, you can run it anywhere because it's already been compiled. While the interpreter, the source code has to be interpreted each time you run the file. The compiler basically is more difficult, compiled languages, because it's more harder to find problems or debug issues. While the interpreter is much easier to debug, the compiler is faster and the interpreter is much slower. So these are some key differences between compilers and interpreters. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to take a look at Python expressions. An expression is anything that has a value. For example, the number three, four plus five, and the string hello. Text are referred to as strings in Python. An expression can contain operators like the plus operator. It can also contain upper hands. For example, in the example four plus five, four is the upper hand. Also five is an upper hand while the plus is known as an operator. I've got my notebook dashboard open. I'm going to create a new notebook. So here in this area here, I'll click on the drop down for new and I'll select Python 3, which is going to interpret and I'll give the notebook a name. I'll double click on it and I'm going to call it Python expressions and I'll click on the rename button to rename it so it's now saying Python expression so you can see I've got the blue strip which means I'm in the command mode inside the cell so I'm just going to issue a simple command I'm going to say 3 plus 4 and to run the cell I just click on run cell or you do shift and enter so I click run and that gives me the output of seven. Let me enter another expression. I'll do seven times two, and I'll run the cell, click on run, and that gives me a value of 14. Let me enter a string expression this time. So a string, which is known as a text, has to be enclosed in quotes. You can either enclose it in double quotes or single quotes, but you can't mix the quotes. So I'll say, hello world. To run this cell, I click on run cell and it gives me the output, hello world. In these example expressions here, the three here is known as an upper hand. The plus is known as an operator. The four is also called an upper hand. All right. And here also in the second cell, we've got the seven as an upper hand. The asterisk represents multiplication in Python, which is known as an operator. The two is an upper hand. And in this cell here, we've got a string value, 
which is basically a text. So in order for Python to understand that this is a text, you have to enclose it in quotes. So on, on either side of the text. So you can have either single quotes on either side or double on either side. You can't mix single and double quotes. In this video, I gave you a brief introduction to Python expressions. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. Python statements are basically a set of instructions that you give to the computer to perform a task or a series of tasks. Python statements can contain one or more expressions. It can also be on a single line or it can consist of multiple lines. To illustrate examples of Python statements, I'm going to create a new notebook. So on the new here, I'll click on the drop down and click Python 3. Python 3 contains the Python interpreter that will interpret the code we write into a machine readable format that the computer can understand. So I'll click Python 3 and I will just double click to give it to give it a name. So I'll change the name to say Python statements. And I'll click rename. So this notebook is going to be called Python statements. Um, so you can see we've got a blue strip here, which means I'm in the command mode. So I'm going to start up with a single line statement. It's going to be a simple expression. I'm going to say nine times nine, and I'm going to run the cell by clicking on the run button. And that gives me 81. So this is known as a single line statement because the statement or the instructions is just on one line. So depending on what you want the computer to do, you can have a statement that consists of several hundred, even thousands lines of code, depending on the task you want the computer to perform. So I'm going to give you an example of a multi line statement. So I'm going to use a for loop. So I'm going to say for I in range and a range is basically an inbuilt function in Python, which you can use to specify a range. So I'm going to say 13, I specify the range and then I will add the colon. The colon is very important. It creates an indentation level. So if I press enter, you can see here it's giving me an indentation level so I can add another line of statement. So I'm going to add a print function. So I'm going to get it to print the value of I. So let me click to run the code. You can see here it's printed out from 0 to 12. All right. So when you specify a range, the first number is usually a 0. Okay. Hence it has not printed out 13 because zero here represents the first range. Okay. So this is an example of a multi-line statement because the statement is on two lines. Let me explain what this code is in this cell number two here. The four basically is used to iterate over a range of values. So here I'm saying this four is going to be used to loop through a range of 13 numbers, a sequence. So the I here is going to be what is going to store the value. So I say for I in range, range basically is a inbuilt function in Python. So we're basically using this for loop to loop through this range and we're going to print out each value of this I. So I here contains all the values. So what it's going to do is the first value is going to print is going to be zero. So it prints from zero to 12, which gives it 13 values. Okay. So that's basically what that code is doing. In this video, I gave you a brief introduction to what 
Python statements are. So a statement can contain one or multiple lines of code depending on the task you want the computer to perform. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. Python comments can be very useful. They can be used to explain your Python code to yourself and to others. Also, comments can be used to prevent execution of code when you are testing your code. So you may have certain aspect of your code that you don't want to run during execution. To achieve that, you can add comments to that aspect of code, which prevents the execution of that code. So this can be very useful during testing purposes. There are two main types of comments in Python. We have a single line comment and a multi line comment. So the single line comment is represented by the hash symbol, while a multi line comment you can either represent it by three double quotes on either side of the code you want to comment, or you can have three single quotes on either side of the code you are trying to comment. I've got my Jupyter dashboard. I'm going to create a new notebook. So on that new, I'll click Python 3 and I'm going to call this notebook Python comments and then I'll click rename. Inside the cell, I'm going to issue out a simple print function here and I'm going to get it to print out the text hello world and next to it I'm going to add a single line comment which is represented by this hash symbol. When the comment is on the right hand side of the code it does not affect the code running but when you place the comment in front of the code it will affect the code. So if I click run here, it will give me the output because the comment is on the right hand side. So notice in the second cell here, I have placed the comment in front of the code. Notice that's commented out all of the code. So it will prevent this code from being executed. So if I click on the run button, you see nothing gets executed because of the comment. So be very careful where you place your comment. If you place it in front of the code, it will comment out the entire line. But if you place it on the right hand side, as we've done in cell number one, it does not affect the code from being executed. So these are known as single line comment. So let's give you an example of a multiple line comment. So to do that, you do three quotes on either side. All right, so you can press enter. So you either have three double quotes or three single quotes. You can't mix the quote. And then any text that is enclosed between these quotes will be commented out and the code will not be executed. In this cell here, we've got a multi-line comment because it spans multiple line. This is one line, this is another line. So we can see that the multi-line is enclosed by this quotes. So we have three double quotes before and three double quotes on the notice it has turned all the text in between the quotes red, which means that when I run this cell, those lines of code will be ignored. The only line that will print is this print function here that says hello world. So if I run this cell by clicking on the run button, you can see here it's printed out hello world and it has ignored this here, which is the multi-line comments. So comments are very useful in Python. They help you explain what your code is doing and also can help you comment out certain lines of code if you don't want those lines of code to be executed. So that is it for this video.
Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. There are three basic data types in Python. We have the numbers data type. This basically includes integers, which are known as int, and floating point numbers, which are known as float. An integer basically is a whole number, and a floating point number is basically numbers that includes decimals. We also have the string data type, which basically is a text or a sequence of characters. It's also referred to as str. And then we have the Boolean data type, which is a true or false value, is also known as the bool. You can get the data type of any object by using the type function in Python. So basically you pass in a value in between the parentheses and this type function will return the type of data type. So let's create a new notebook and experiment with some data types. So I'm going to create a new notebook. So I'll come here, say new, click on Python 3 and I will give the notebook a name and I'm going to call it Python data types. So we're going to experiment with the basic data types in Python. I'm going to use the type function to enable or detect the type of data type it is. So I am going to start with an integer, which is a whole number. So I'll do the type command. And inside this type function, I'm going to pass in a value, which is 80. So 80 is a whole number. So if I click on this run command, you see here it has returned that this type of data is an integer. So an integer is a whole number. It can also include negative numbers. So if I type in, I do a type, and inside that type function, if I pass in negative 30 and run, it also return an integer because they can contain both positive and negative values. So let's try and get a data type that is a floating point. A float is basically a number that includes decimals. So we'll do type and inside this function, let's do 28.5 and run this cell. You can see it has returned a float. You can also have a negative float value as well. So if I do type and in between I do negative 1.0 and do a run, it also returns a float. Next, let's try and get a string data type. So we'll do a type. Remember with a string, you always have to enclose the values in quotes. So I'm just going to say hello and I do a run. You can see here it has returned that this is a string data type, which is specified by the word str. Next, let's do a Boolean data type. So I'm going to do a type and inside this type function, I'm going to say seven is greater than six. And this should return a bool value, which means it is true. I'll click run. You can see it's returned a bool. If I do it the other way, I do a type and say seven is less than six. It will also return a bool value because seven is not less than six. So it would be a false value, which would be a bool. So if I click run, you can see here it has returned a bool value. Data types are a very important concept in Python. So when you have to store data in variables, it's good to know the type of data type you are storing. So that is it for this video on basic Python data types. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. What is casting? 
Forecasting basically is the process of converting from one data type to another data type. There are several functions that you can use in casting. For example, if you want to cast a value that is in a different data type to an integer, you use the int function. If you want to cast to a floating point number, you use a float function. And if you want to cast to a string, you use the str function. Let's create a new notebook. So I'm going to click on the drop down, click Python 3, and I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call it casting data types. And I'll click the rename button. So let's cast a value that is a float into an integer. To do that, we're going to use the int function. So I type in int and inside that int function, I'm going to pass in a value that is a floating point. So I'll do 2.8 and I'll run this cell. You can see here it has returned two, which is a whole number and an integer. So it's converted the value of 2.8 which was a floating point into an integer data type. So let's try and convert a whole number into a floating point number. So we're going to have to use the float function. And inside the float function, I'm going to pass in a whole number, which is an integer. So let's pass in 40 and then I'll run that. You can see here it's converted it to 40.0, which is now a floating point number. Next, let's convert an integer into a string. So to do that, we're going to use the str function and we're going to pass in a value that is a whole number. So let's pass in the value of three. Now, if I run this, it will convert this into a string data type. So I click on run. You can see here it's converted into a string because it has quotes on either side. Anything with quotes on either side is treated as a string. So that's basically how casting works. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. What are variables? Variables are named containers for storing data values. Unlike other programming languages, Python does not have a specific command for declaring a variable. In Python, a variable is created the moment you assign a value to a named container. There are a few rules that you need to know before you create variables in Python. A variable name must start with a letter or the underscore character. The variable name can contain alphanumeric characters and the underscore character. So it can contain from characters A to Z, numeric from zero to nine and the underscore character. A variable name cannot start with a number. Also, variable names are case sensitive. So for example, if you declare a variable called name with uppercase N, and you're trying to access that variable with lowercase N, you will get an error. Another important rule is that you cannot name your variable names after Python keywords. There are certain keywords that are reserved for the Python programming language, which you cannot use as variable names. On the screen here, I've got a list of some reserved words in Python. They are called keywords. So these are keywords that the programming language actually uses. So you, when you create a variable, you cannot use any of these words listed in this table.
Let's create some variables. So the first thing I need to do is create a new notebook. So I'll click on the drop down and click Python 3. And we'll give the notebook a name. And I'm going to call it Python variables. And I'll click rename and that will rename it to Python variables. So let's create a simple variable. The first thing you need to do is have a named container. So I'm going to create a variable. So name is going to be the container. So to the moment you assign a value to the name container, that's when it becomes a variable. So the name container in this case, I've called it name and you use the equals to sign to assign values to variables. So I'm going to, because this is going to be a string, I'm going to enclose the value in quote. All right. So I've just created a new variable and I assigned it a value of blue line. So if I click run, nothing will happen because this, the value is stored inside this name. So if I want to retrieve the value inside this variable, what I can do, I can come here and say print and I'll pass in the name. Remember the variable names are case sensitive. So I have to reference it in lowercase because I created the name in lowercase. So now if I run the cell, you can see here, is return the value. You can also change the value of a variable container just by referencing the name of the variable. So if I can come here, I'll call the variable again and I can change the value. So for example, I want to call the variable, I change the name from blue lime to Jack. And if I try to do a print statement again and pass in the name of the variable, which is name, it will now return Jack. So even though you've assigned a value to a variable, you can always change what the variable stores just by reassigning the value. Let's create a couple more variables here. So I'm going to create another one. I'm going to call this greetings and I'm going to assign a greeting to it. So I'm going to enclose the value in text. I'm going to say Hello world. All right. So that's going to be the value that this variable called greetings is going to store. So I'm going to run it. Nothing will happen. So each time I want to reference this variable, I can just call it by its name. If I call it greetings and return and click on the run, you can see here it has returned the name, what it stored. Okay, if we want to return it without the quotes, we can wrap that into a print function. And inside the print function, we just call the name of the variable, which is greetings and run. You can see it printed out without the quotes around it. I've noticed I've spelled the word wrong. So if I want to fix that, all I need to do is call the variable by its name which is greetings. And I'm going to fix that by changing that. So I'll say, hello world and just run that. So now if I call this variable inside a print function, it will then print out hello world. Let's create one more. So I'm going to call this variable new underscore year and I'm going to give it a value of 2020 because this is a numerical value you don't need to enclose the value in quotes so I'll click run so now if I want to access the value of this variable I just call the variable by its name which is new underscore year and click run and you can see it gives me the value that is stored in that variable container. With some programming languages, you have to specify the data type for a particular variable. 
before you assign it. Python doesn't do that. Python, you can just create something and just assign a value to it. In this video, I introduced you to variables in Python and we also created a few variable examples. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. What is a Python list? A Python list is a collection of data that can be of mixed data types. Unlike variables that can only store one value in a container, a Python list can store multiple values inside one container. Each item in a list is separated by a comma and you can create a list by using square brackets. For example, you can create a list called fruits and you assign the values or the items for that list inside square brackets and you separate each item by a comma. You can access individual items in a list by the index position. So the first item is always index zero. The second item in the list is index one and so on. Also, you can change the order in which an item is positioned in a list by changing the index position. Let's create a new notebook. So I'll come here to new. Python 3 and I'm going to double click and give it a name. I'm going to call it Python list and I'll click rename. So you can see here we have a new notebook called Python list. So let's go ahead and create some list. In this cell, I've created a new list called animals and I've assigned some values or elements to the list. If I want to access any item or elements from the list, I will have to do that using their index number. So the first item on the list will always have an index of zero the second will have an index of one and so on. To access an individual item from a list, you do that using the index position. So you can see here in this cell, I'm using the print statement to print out the index of the item one. So that is going to be dog because the first item is going to be zero. So if I run this cell, you can see here is printed that dog as the first index. Okay, the first index is zero, but the item with the index of one is dog. You can also have negative indexing. Negative indexing means you can access an item from the end of the list using a negative. So if you're doing a negative one, that means you're accessing the very last item in a list. If you're doing a negative two, you're accessing the second last item on the list. You can see here, I'm accessing negative two, which means I expect it to return penguin. So if I run this now, you can see it has returned penguin. I'm creating another list here in this cell called fruits and it's got three items in this list. So I'm just going to run the cell to create it. To access an item from the list, you just reference the index. For example, here, I want to access the fruit called cherry. I just call the name of the list and pass in the index. If I click run, you can see here it has returned cherry. If you don't want the quotes enclosed, just do a print statement and wrap it around the print statement like I did here in this cell number two. That will return the item without quotes. Another thing you can do, you can change the value of an item in a list. For example, the list called fruits, I want to replace the value of apple with orange. All I need to do is reference the name of the list, 
pass in the index of what I want to change, which is zero, zero is apple, and then assign a new value, which is orange. So if I run that, that will change that. So if I now call the name of the list, I should no longer have apple listed. You can see the position of apple has been replaced by orange. You can also add items to a list by using the append method. So in this cell here, I'm going to add apple to this list. So you do that using the append method. So you call the name of the list, which is fruit dot append. And inside the parentheses for that method, you pass in the name of the item you want to insert. And normally that will add that at the end of the list. So if I run that, it will add that to the list. So if I now call the name of the list, we should have Apple listed at the end here. I'm creating another list here with mixed data type. So you can create a list that has a mixture of data types, and you can also have a list include on the other list. So in this list here called mixed underscore data, inside the items, I've got a string, I've got an integer, I've got a float, I've got a boolean, and I've got a list. See this list I created here called fruit. I'm adding that to this new list. So let me run that and that creates it. So if I want to access an item, for example, if I want to access the integer from that list, so I reference the name of the list, which is mixed data, and I pass in the name, the value, or the index of that integer is one, which is 47. So if I run that now, that gives me the value. You can also remove items from a list. Now there are a few ways you can do that. You can use the pop function. So you call the name of the list, in this case, fruits.pop. And inside the parentheses, you pass in the index of the item you want to remove from the list. So in this fruits here, index number three is going to be apple. If you don't supply the index, it will automatically remove the last item from the list. This is the second way you can use the remove method. I've commented that both because I only want the first method to run. So you can do a fruits that remove and pass in the value of the item you want to remove. You can also use the delete key. You do DEL fruits, and then you pass in the index of the item, and that will also remove it from the list. But in this example, I'm only going to use the pop method. So I'm going to run this cell, and you can see here it tells me it has removed apple from that list. So if I type in fruits and run the cell, you can see Apple is no longer listed. Another thing you can do is loop through a list. And you can do that using a for loop. So in this example here, I'm saying for X, X is going to represent each item in the list. So I say for X in the list called animals, I want it to print X. So it will print all the items. So if I click run, you can see here it's printed out all the items in the list. Another thing you can do is check the length of a list. So if you want to find out how many items there are in the list, this is the function. There's a function called len. So because I want to print it out, I'm wrapping it inside this print function. And inside the len function, you pass in the name of the list. So if I run this now, it gives me eight. It tells me that that list called animals has eight items in it. Another thing you can do is clear or empty a list. Um, to do that, there is a special function called clear. So this is a list I want to empty called fruit. So you do fruits or clear, you add the parentheses, you run that, and that should clear the list. So if I type in fruits now, it should return an empty list. You can see it's returned an empty list. So that is it for this video. In this video, we learned about a Python list. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. 
What is a Python tuple? A tuple is a collection of data that can be of mixed data type. In Python, a tuple can store multiple values in comparison to a variable that can only store one value. Each item in a tuple is separated by a comma. You can also create a tuple using parentheses. For example, you can create a tuple called fruits and then use the equals to to assign values to the tuple, which are placed inside parentheses. To access the individual items in a tuple, you do that by the index. So the very first item will have an index of zero, second item will have an index of one, and so on. Also, one very important distinction between a tuple and a list is that a tuple cannot be changed once you have created it. You can't add items to the tuple and you cannot remove items from the tuple. It is immutable. Let's go ahead and create some tuple. So in this cell here, I'm creating a tuple called animals. I'm using the equals to to assign values to the tuples and the values are placed in between the parentheses. So I'm just going to run the cell to create the tuple. So to access an item from the tuple, you use the index of that item. For example, if I want to access this item called goat, this will have an index of three because the first item has an index of zero, one, two, three. So all I need to do is come here and call the name of the tuple, which is called animals. I add my square bracket and I'm passing the index of the item. So if I run that, that gives me goat. You can also use negative indexing to access the values of a tuple. Negative index basically will access the item from the end of the list. So here I'm accessing negative one, which means I'm accessing the last item from the list, which is tiger. So if I run this, you can see here it's giving me the value of tiger. You can also specify a range of indexes to be returned from a tuple by specifying where to start and where to end the range. So in this example here, I'm using a print function to print out items from the list. So I'm using a range. So what I'm saying is that I want to print from index two to five. So what that will do, it will start the search from index number two which is giraffe and it will end it before index number five. It will not include index five. So it will give me the index number two, which is giraffe and index number three, which is goat, index number four, leopard, but it will not give me index number five, which is lion. So if I run that, you can see here it's giving me giraffe, goat and leopard. You can also use negative indexing on a range. Once you create a tuple, you cannot change it. What that means you cannot add to it. Neither can you change the values. So in this cell here, if I try to change the value of this tuple by trying to reassign the index of zero, which is this bear, if I try to replace that with kangaroo, I will get an error. So if I run that, you can see here, it tells me here, tuple object does not support item assignment. That's because once you create a tuple, you cannot append to it, you cannot change it. Another thing you can do is loop through a tuple. Looping basically means it will iterate through the tuple and print out each item. So I'm saying here, I'm using a for loop. So I'm saying for X in animals, print X. X will represent each item. So if I run the cell, 
you can see here it's printing out all the items in the tuple. If you want to find out how many items there are in a tuple, there is a special function called len, which enables you to return the length of the tuple. So here I am wrapping the len function inside the print function, and I'm passing in the name of the tuple inside the len function. So if I run that, that returns the length of the tuple, which represents the item in the tuple. You can also join tuples together. So in this example here, I'm going to be creating three tuples. So the first one is called letters, and I'm assigning it three values, A, B, C. Second tuple is called numbers, and I'm assigning it three values, one, two, three. The third tuple is called letters, underscore numbers, and the values for this, I am joining using the plus operator to add the tuple called letters to the tuples called numbers. So let me run this cell. So now if I reference this tuple called letters underscore numbers, if I run that, you can see it gives me ABC, one, two, three. The key thing to remember about a tuple is that once a tuple has been created, you cannot change the value, neither can you add to the tuple. So the tuple is unchangeable or immutable once it has been created. So that is it for this video. In this video, we learned about Python tuples. Hello and welcome to this video. What is a Python dictionary? A Python dictionary is a collection which is unordered, which can be changed, and which is also indexed. A Python dictionary is created by using curly brackets. Also, a populated Python dictionary will have keys and corresponding values. So the data inside the populated dictionary is paired. Paired in the sense that they have keys and the keys have corresponding values. You can access the items of a dictionary by referring to its key name inside square brackets. The values of items in a dictionary can be changed. Also, a dictionary can be nested. That means you can have dictionaries inside other dictionaries. I have created a new notebook and inside the notebook, I have got the code here to create a new dictionary. So I'm creating a dictionary called countries underscore cities. You use the equals to sign to assign values to the dictionary and you enclose the values in curly brackets. That's the opening curly brackets. And this here is the closing curly brackets. So these here on the left are the keys. And then these here on the right are the corresponding values. So each item in a dictionary must have a key and the key must have a value. The key is always on the left and the value is always on the right. And then they are separated by the colon. So you can see here, these are all keys and these are their corresponding values. So I'm going to run the cell. When I try to run the cell, I encountered an error. That's because it's telling me here the key that's called Croatia, it tells me where I've made the error. I've left out the closing quotes. So I need to come back here where the cursor is flashing and add the closing quotes. So if I run that again, that should not work. You can access the items in a dictionary by referring to the key or referring to the values or referring to both. In this example here, I am accessing the item in a dictionary via the key. 
So you can see that's the name of the dictionary in square bracket and passing in the value of the key, which is Italy. So if I run this, I expect Rome to return as the value. So let me run that. You can see here it has returned Rome as the value. You can also use a special function called get to return the value of the specified key. So this is the name of the dictionary and I'm using the get function and inside the get function I'm passing in the key, in this case Egypt, and if I run this cell it will return Cairo. So if I run that you can see it has returned Cairo. You can also change the value in a dictionary. So in this cell here I'm changing the value of the key that is called United States. Currently the key for that is New York. I'm going to change it to Atlanta. So if I run this cell now, it should have changed that to Atlanta. If I run the dictionary and just pass in the key United States, it should change it. You should see the change we've just made, which is Atlanta. It should now show Atlanta as a value instead of New York. So let me run that. You can see now it's returned Atlanta. You can also add items to a dictionary. Inside this cell here, I'm adding a new key, which is Japan, and I am setting the value to Tokyo inside this dictionary called countries underscore cities. So I'm going to run this cell. You can notice here that I've got an indentation error. That's because I've accidentally indented. So you can see where the cursor is flashing. I need to move back so that I'm indented properly. If I run that again, you can see now that has worked. So if I print the dictionary, it should now include the new key I've just added, which is Japan. So I click to run. I can see here is added Japan as well. That's Japan is the key and Tokyo is the value. You can also remove items from a dictionary. There are several ways to do this. The first way is by using the pop method. So you call the pop method on the dictionary and you pass in the key of what you want to remove. So I've passed in the key Japan and this will remove the item for the specified key. Another way to do that is by using the delete key. So you type in DEL, the name of the dictionary and you pass in the key inside square brackets and this will remove the item from the specified key. Another way to do that is to use the pop item method. And inside the pop item method, this will remove the last inserted item. All right, I've commented up both because I don't want that to run. I only want to run the pop method. So let me run that and that will, I've run that and also this print function here prints out the modified after removing Tokyo. You can see Tokyo is no longer on the dictionary list after we've removed it using the pop method. You can also loop through the dictionary keys. To do that, you use the for loop, which you use to iterate over the dictionary keys. So we say for X, in the dictionary called countries underscore cities, you print X. X basically will represent each of the keys. So if I run that, you can see here, all is done is printed out just the keys. If you want to print out just the values, there is a special function called values. So you add that function to the name of the dictionary and you print X and that will return only the values. So if I run this cell, you can see it's only returned the values for the dictionary. If you want to get both the keys and the values, there is a special function called items that you can call on the dictionary. So here in this cell, I'm saying for X comma Y comma in countries underscore cities or items. So this will print out the keys and the value X, 
represents the key and Y represents the values. So if I run this cell, you can see here it's printed out the keys and the corresponding values. If you want to check the length of a dictionary, there's a special function called len. You can use that to print the length. So you wrap that inside this print function and then you pass in the name of the dictionary inside the parentheses for the len function. If I run the cell, you can see it's returned six, it tells me the length of my dictionary is six, which means I have six keys and their corresponding values. You can also have nested dictionaries, which means you can have a dictionary inside another dictionary. So in this cell here, I'm creating a dictionary that has other nested dictionary. So the name of the dictionary is family, and you can see it contains other dictionary. This is the first dictionary called first child, second dictionary called second child, and third dictionary called third child. So if I click to run the cell, that should create the dictionary. If you want to access a nested dictionary, you can do that by referencing the name of the parent dictionary. And then in square brackets, you pass in the name of the nested dictionary you want to access. So in this cell here, I want to access the dictionary called second child. So if I run the cell, you can see it's giving me the keys and the corresponding values for the dictionary called second child. You can also clear or empty a dictionary by using the clear method. So I'm calling the clear method on the dictionary called family. If I run that, that should clear it. So if I now call the dictionary, it should return an empty dictionary. If I run that, you can see here, it has returned an empty dictionary. So that is it for this video. In this video, we learned about Python dictionaries. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. What are Python operators? Python operators are used to perform operations on variables and values. There are different types of operators in Python. So I'm going to cover some of the operators in Python. The first one is the arithmetic operators. So these are basically used with numeric values to perform common mathematical operations. So they include things like plus, subtraction, multiplication, division, and this here is called the modulus operator. The next type of operator is the assignment operators. And these type of operators are basically used to assign values to variables. So these are what the symbols look like. You've got the equals to, the plus equals, minus equals, multiplication equals, division equals, and modulo equals. We also have the comparison operators, which are used to compare values and they include double equals to if you want to compare if two values are strictly equals to each other you use the double equals to sign if you want to check if one value is not equals to another you use this if a value is greater than you use that if a value is less than if a value is greater than or equals to if a value is less than or equals to so these are all co comparison operators the final type of operator I'm going to cover in this video is called the logical operators. They are used to combine conditional statements. So they include things like and, or, or not. I have created a new notebook. So inside this cell here, I'm going to add some operators and I'm going to run through the code to explain what the operators do. 
I have added some code into this notebook cell to illustrate how arithmetic operators work. So I'm going to start with the addition operator. So here I'm creating two variable, variable X and variable Y. Variable X, I've given a value of seven and variable Y, I'm given a value of five. So I'm using the print function to print the value of X plus Y. So this here is the addition operator. All right. So I will run the cell later. I'm not running the cell now, but I'm just showing you the examples of the operators within the arithmetic operator. Here we've got two values, value X, value Y. I'm using the print statement to print the value of X, subtract the value of Y. So this here is the subtraction operator. Next, we've got the multiplication. The multiplication in Python is represented by the asterisk. Again, we've got two values, X and Y. We are using the print function to multiply the value of X times the value of Y. And then here we have two variables, X is equals to 12, Y is equals to four. And we're using the print function to divide X by y slash is known as the division operator. We've got one more, which is the modulus operator. So we've got two values, values x equals seven, value y equals five. We're using the print function to print x modulus y. Modulus basically means when you divide by a number, it will only, only return the remainder from that division. For example, if you divide um, seven by five, basically five can go into seven once, remainder two. So the modulus operator will return the remainder, which is two. So let me run the cell and you can see the output. You can see here, the first value here is 12, which is X plus Y. So seven plus five is 12. And the second value here is two. So if you take away seven from five, which is the subtraction operator, that gives you two. The third value here says 35, which is multiplication. If you multiply seven by five, that will give you 35. Next one is the division. If you divide 12 by four, that will return three. And for the modulus operator, modulus will always return the remainder. So five can go into seven, one, remainder one time, remainder two. So it returns the remainder, which is two. So this is how the arithmetic operator works. I've added some code into my second cell in my notebook. This is the second cell. And this code here is going to illustrate how the assignment operator works. Assignment operators basically used to assign values to variables. We already used that in the previous example for the arithmetic operator. You can see all this equals to sign here. We're using it to assign values to variables. All right. So there are different types of assignment operators. So here I've got a variable called city. I've given it a value of London using the equals to, which is the assignment operator. So here I'm telling the print function to print the value of city. Here I've got two values, two variables, X equals to seven, and then X equals to plus equals to. When you have a plus equals to, you're basically saying, add this three to the value of X. So when you print X, X will now print 10 because X is seven. And we're saying, we're calling the value, we're calling X here and we're adding plus equals to means add three. And then you're using the equals to, to assign the three to the seven, making it 10. So the same process with the minus, if you do a negative equals to, that means you're taking three away from the value of X. Same thing with the multiplication. 
what, what that is saying is that you are multiplying 3 by 7 with the division the same thing you are multiple you are dividing 3 the value of 3 here slash equals to me divide equals to you are dividing that by 3 that will return 2 same example with the modulus here we've got the variable x equals to 7 then x equals to the percent equals so which is modulus equals to 3 what that means is that for the modulus operator you're going to divide 3 by 7 and return whatever is left so this here print x will return 1 because 3 can go into 7 two times it will have one remainder that's what this print x is going to return so let's run this cell and then we can see so you can see here these are all the values let's go to the top of the value it says the we're printing x here which is a value of city and you can see here it prints london and then the next one here we have the var variable x and we're adding three to it so we print x x now becomes 10. so the same thing here we've got the variable x which is seven we using the negative equals to it will subtract three from that that will return four and then here we are multiplying three by seven give us 21 and here for the division we're dividing three by six gives us two and here for the modulus three goes into seven two times remember one so the modulus will return one i have added some more code to a new cell here to illustrate how the comparison operators works so comparison operators are basically used to compare two values so let me run through the examples here here i've got a variable x equals to seven variable y equals to three i'm using the print function to check the comparison where you have a double equals to it means you are comparing so it's saying print x is equals to a single equals to is used to assign a value where you have a double equals to is used to compare a value so know the difference here x equals to 7 is a single equals to that is used to assign values to variables here in the print function i am checking comparison here so i'm checking if x is equals to y all right so this if i run the cell this is going to return false because seven is not equals to three if we look in this example x equals seven y equals to three print x where you have the question mark it means print x is not equals to y this will return true because x which is seven is not equals to three and then we have again i'm going to use the same variables for the examples variable x is seven variable y is three i'm using the print function to print is x greater than y this will return true because seven is greater than three same thing here we're checking is x less than y this is return false because seven is not less than three again the same thing we're checking x is less is greater than or equals to y this will return true because seven is greater or equals to three in this example same thing check if x is less than or equals to y this will return false because seven is neither less than or equals to three so let me run the code and you can see the output with a comparison um, operator you always get a true or false value because you're checking things is this equals to what and so on so you always get a boolean result boolean basically is a true or false outcome i have entered some code into another cell and this cell here is going to illustrate how the logical operators work logical operators are used to combine conditional statements okay so here i've got a variable x equals to seven 
and I'm using the print function to check some conditions. So I'm saying x is greater than 3 and this and here is a logical operator and x is less than 10. This is going to return true because 7 is greater than 3 and 7 is less than 10. All right, so if we look at this example here, x equals to 7, we're going to use a print function to check the comparison. We're saying x is greater than 3 or x is less than 4. This is going to return true because one of the condition where you have an or, all you need is one of the conditions to be true and that evaluates to true. If you have an and, both conditions must be true for it to return true. You can see this x is greater than 3 is one condition and then x is less than 10 is another condition. The and here means that both conditions must be true for the outcome to be true. With the or logical operator, you only need to have one of the expression to be true and that will return true. So in this case, x is greater than 3. That, will ret tr that returns true, okay? But 7 is not less than 4. You can see here it says x less than 4. 7 is not less than 4, so this part of the expression is false, but it will evaluate to true because one of the conditions in the comparison is true when you use the OR operator. Here we're saying x is 7. We're using the print function to use the NOT part of the logical operator. We're saying NOT x is greater than 3 and x is less than 10. This is going to return false because NOT is used to reverse the result. So let me run the cell and you can see the outcome. You can see here, first outcome is true, second one is true, and the last one is false. In this video, we learned about some of the operators in Python. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to learn about Python conditional statements. What are conditional statements? Conditional statements are statements that perform certain type of computations or actions based on certain conditions which will evaluate to true or false. These conditions are known as Boolean conditions. There are three main types of conditional statements. There's the if statements, the elif statements, and the else statements. What are if statements? If statements are used to check conditions before executing a certain block of code. They help make your programs make smarter decisions and they will only run or execute the code inside the if block only when the condition evaluates to be true. If statements use comparison and logical operators to check whether conditions are true or false. I have created a new notebook and inside this cell, I have some code here to illustrate how the if statements work. So you write an if statement using the if keyword. So I have a couple of variables here. Variable A has a value of 40. Variable B has a value of 80. So I'm using the if statement here to check if variable B is greater than A. Now that is the condition. So the greater than sign is what we use to check the condition. So B has 80 and A has 40. So B is definitely greater than A. So that condition will evaluate to true. So the code inside the if block. So when you write an if statement, you have the colon and then Underneath the colon is the block of code 
that will execute when the condition is true. So this print function here will execute this code that says B is greater than A because that condition is true. If the condition was false, nothing will happen. The code will not execute. So let me run the code by clicking on the run command. You can see it's executed the code inside the if block, which is this text that says B is greater than A. What are L if statements? L if statements are used to check multiple expressions until they find a condition that is true. When they do find a condition that is true, it will only execute the block of code as soon as one of the conditions evaluates to true. So if you're checking for a few conditions, it will execute the code it finds for the first conditions that evaluates to true. I have a block of code inside my second cell to illustrate how the if statement works. So I have two variables. Variable A has a value of 40. Variable B has a value of 40. So they both have the same value. So I've got an if statement, which is checking, is B greater than A? So if B is greater than A, the code inside the if block, which is a print statement, will execute. In this condition, the condition is false because both of them have the same value. So that code inside the if block will not execute. And then we have the code in the L if block, which is checking. So I'm using a comparison operator to check. If you have a double equals to, that means you're checking if something is equals to another. So I'm checking is A equals to B. We know that they are because they both have the same value. So the code inside the L if block will, will execute because that condition is true. They both are equals to each other. So let me run this cell and you will see that the code inside the L if block is the one that has been executed, which is this print statement that says A and B are equal. What are else statements? Else statements are used to execute a block of code when conditions evaluate only to force. Added some block of code here into this new cell to illustrate how the else statement works. So I have two variables. Variable A has a value of 20. Variable B has a value of 10. I've got an if statement to check if variable B is greater than A. If it is, the code inside the if block of statements, which is a print statement, will execute. In this case, B is less than 20. So that will evaluate to false. So that code will not execute. We move on to the L if code. In the L if we're checking is A is equals to B. This will evaluate to false. So that code block will not execute. We move on to the else statement, which is going to evaluate to true because A is greater than B. So that code will execute. So let me run the code and you'll see is saying A is greater than B because that will that is the only condition that is true. We also have what is called a nested if statement, which is basically an if statement embedded inside another if statement. I have added a block of code into this cell to illustrate how the nested if statement works. So I've got a variable X which has a value of 51. And I've got my first if statement, which is checking if X is greater than 10. That is going to evaluate to true. So the statement, which is the print statement above 10, is going to be printed. And then we have the second if statement, which is embedded inside the first one, which is checking if X is greater than 20. That is going to evaluate to true. So the print statement, which says above 20, 
is going to be executed. All right. So we have two statements that evaluate to true. So if I run that, we should have two printouts. The first one says above 10, which is for this one. And the second says above 20, which is for that. So that's basically how the nested if statement works. So in this video, we've learned about Python conditional statements. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. What are Python loops? Loops in Python is basically a sequence of code that you want to be repeated or you want to run continuously until certain conditions are met. So if you have a block of code you want to execute several times based on certain conditions, you can use a loop and that code will continue to run until certain conditions has been reached. There are two basic types of loops in Python. We have the while loop, which are basically used to execute a set of code continuously until a condition evaluates to false. So as long as the condition within the code is true, that block of code will continue to execute. The next type of loop is called a for loop, which is basically used to iterate over a list of item. So for loops are particularly useful when you're using a list, a tuple or a dictionary. It can even be used to loop through a string. So the for loop, if you want to iterate and say print out certain elements or all the elements in a list, you can use a for loop to iterate over that sequence. I've created a new notebook. Inside the notebook cell here, I've added some code to illustrate how the while loop works. So with a while loop, you have to have an initial starter point. So I'm doing that with this variable called i, and I've set the variable to a value of one. So now that we have a starting point, you can now start the while loop. So to implement a while loop, you type in the keyword while, and then you specify the conditions you are trying to check for. So I'm saying this variable i, as long as this variable i is less than seven, I want this print function to keep printing the value of i. So what this will do, it will continue printing i until it reaches seven. So once it goes past seven, that condition becomes false and the loop will stop. Also, when you have a while loop, it is very, very important to add an increment counter because the variable has a value of one. So here you can see I have this counter here plus equals to which is means it's going to be adding one to the value of that variable each time. So the first loop will run, it will print out the value of one and then this statement will add plus equals to means add one to the value of the variable i. So it will keep adding one until it gets, until it exceeds that level. So the moment it comes to seven, the loop will stop because it would have evaluated to false because i will no longer be less than seven. So, but it's very important you add this increment counter. If not, the loop will go on forever. It will never be false. So the counter is very important so that at some point it evaluates to false. All right. So let me run this and then you can see what I mean. You can see here it will print, it prints up to six. It doesn't print seven because that basically is where the condition becomes false. So it will keep printing as long as this condition is true. So once it becomes greater than seven, it turns to false and then the loop stops. But it's very important that you always add the increment to the original value, which is one. If not, the loop will continue forever, which is, which means that this condition, I will always be less than seven. If you don't add this increment to be adding one each time, the loop runs 
to the original value. I've added some code here into this second cell to illustrate how to use the break statement with a loop. So the break statement basically is used to stop a loop even if the while condition is true. So here we can see the counter i, the variable i is equals to 1 and I'm setting the while loop to say while i is less than 7 I want it to print the value of i. And you can see here the increment counter is very important so that the loop will eventually um, evaluate to false and it will stop running. So you can see here I'm adding a break statement. So I say if when i becomes equals to 4, I want there to be a break. All right, so let's see how that works. We'll run that. And you can see here it stops at 4, even though the condition is still true because i at this stage is still less than 7. But we are breaking the loop using this break statement. You can also have the continue statement, which you can use to continue from where you stopped within the current iteration of that loop. So the continue works slightly different from the way the break statement works. So here we've got the variable i equals to zero. I was saying that while i is less than seven, here you can see we are adding the increment here because the initial value is zero, so we are not increasing the value to one. And here we're saying if i, when i becomes four, continue and then we're telling it to print i. So you will see here in when I run this cell that the number four is going to be missing from the report, from the result because we, we're telling it to continue when it gets to four. So it will skip four and then continue with the loop. So if I click run, you can see here it does one, two, three, it skips four and then prints out the rest. I've got some code in this cell here to illustrate how the for loop works. So with the for loop, you have to use that to iterate over a list. So I've got a list here called fruits and it's got different elements in it. So if I can use a for loop to iterate over this list of items and then print out each value. So to implement a for loop, you type in for, x here is going to represent each item in this list called fruits. So I say for x in fruits, print x. So if I run the cell here, you can see here it's printing out all the items within that list. You can also use a for loop to iterate into a string. So you see here I've got a string called strawberry. I can use a for loop to iterate over each character within this string called strawberry. So if I run that, you can see here it's printing out all the letters that make up the word strawberry. You can also have a nested for loop, which is a loop inside another loop. So here I have two lists. The first is called ADJ and the second is called fruits. They both have three items. So here I'm implementing a for loop. So I'm saying for x in the first list called ADJ, x will represent each item. And then the second loop, I will say for y, y represent each item in the list called fruits. So I'm using the print statement to print x, We should print all the items in the list x and the items in the list called y. So if I run that to make more sense, you can see here it's saying red, which is this value, and then apple for the other one and so on. Okay, so that's basically how a nested for loop works. It's a loop inside another loop. In this video, we learned about Python loops. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, you will learn about Python functions. You will learn how to create a function and also how to call or activate a function. What are functions? In Python, functions are pieces of code 
or code blocks that are used to do something. Basically, they are a group of related statements that are used to perform a specific task. Functions are useful. They help break your programs into smaller and modular chunks so that as your program grows larger and larger, the functions makes the programs more organized and easier to manage. Functions avoids repetition and makes it possible for you to reuse your code. So once you've created a function, you can reuse it as many times as you want. Once you've created a function, the function does not do nothing until you activate or call the function. So the process of activating the function is also referred to as executing or running a function. And you do that by calling the function with its name. So whatever name you've called your function, if you want to activate or execute it, you need to call it by its name. When you create functions, you can have them have parameters, which are variables. So you can create a function and then passing variables, which are known as parameters. And also when you are calling or executing the functions, you have to call it and supply arguments. The arguments are referred to as values. Functions can return data as a result. There are several types of functions. There are built-in functions and they're also user-defined function. An example of a built-in function is the print function, which you can use to print stuff or data on the screen. And then you have your own custom, which are user created custom. They're also referred to as custom functions. The syntax for creating a function is fairly straightforward. You use the keyword def, which means you're trying to define a function followed by the name of the function. And then you have the parentheses and then the colon. The colon is very important because that creates an indentation for the function. So anything underneath the indentation here, which is created by this colon, anything here is called the function body. So when you execute or call the function, this is the part of the code that will execute. I have created a new notebook and inside the notebook, I've added a block of code. Here, I'm creating a new function called sum. So you create a function by using the keyword DEF space. You give the function a name and inside the parentheses, you can pass in parameters. If you want to, parameters are like variables. So you can see here I've passed in two parameters, X and Y. You can also leave the parentheses blank without any parameters. So after you define the function, you add the colon, the colon creates this indentation level here. And then this is the code that will be executed when this particular function is called. So when you create a function, the function does nothing until you call or activate the function. So here I'm calling the function, which is called sum. And inside the parentheses, I'm passing in two values. The first value will be for the variable X and the second value will be for the variable Y. So when you pass in values inside, when you're calling a function, they are known as arguments. So four and five here are called arguments. Y, X and Y inside the parentheses are known as parameters. So let me run this function. I'll click run and you can see here it has returned a value of nine because I've passed in two arguments, four and five, which will then execute what this function says. It will print out the value of X plus Y. In the example function we created, we use parameter and also argument. I just want to explain again the difference between the parameter and the argument. 
the parameter is the variable that is defined inside the functions parentheses while the argument is the actual value you pass or give to the function when the function is called. What is the default parameter value? This is the value that a function uses when the function is called without passing any value to the function. Only parameters at the end of a parameter list can have a default value as values are assigned by the position. In the second cell here, I've created a variable called student underscore names and inside the parentheses, I have specified a default parameter value. All right, so this is the value that the function is going to use when I, if I call the function without passing it any value. So the name inside the parentheses is names, this is going to be the variable and the value is going to be blue line. So when I call the function, this is what is going to happen is going to print this text, hello plus whatever value that this variable names has. So here I'm calling the function with and without arguments. The first one here, I'm calling the function without passing any value to it. So if I call it now, this should print the default parameter value, which is blue line. It should say, hello, blue line. Here I'm calling it and I'm passing it a value of John. So now the name variable will now have the value of John and this I'm calling here again and giving it a different value. So let me run that and then you can see, you can see it says hello blue line, which is the default value because I call the function without giving it any value or argument. I call the function again, give it a value of John. It says hello John, call it again and give it a value of Jane and it says hello Jane. So it basically execute the code in the body of the function, which is this print statement here. So whatever value the variable names has, it will say hello to the value of that names variable.